Welcome to the Breaking Bio Podcast for July 4th, 2012. I'm your host, Stephen Hamblin, for the University of New South Wales, and with me today is Morgan Jackson. Say hi, Morgan. Hi, everybody. All right, and all of our various co-hosts, some of whom you've seen before and some of whom you haven't, are off, well, doing more exciting things. Most of them are at the Evolution Conference coming up next week. Uh, that's in your neck of the woods. It is. Up in Ottawa, it's just kind of making me bitter that I can't get the five hours up the road to get to it when everybody else is coming around the world for it. But it's an expensive conference, so I'm not that bitter. <laughs> how, how expensive is it? Uh, I think it was like $450 for a student registration. Why? That was early, too. I, yeah, it's really, really expensive. All right. You know, seven potential co-hosts on this podcast, and so far we've seen four. Yep. Right. yep. And you are the, you're the big star with the uh, repeat second appearance. Well, I, I won't catch your three streak here, but uh, I'll try. I'm also unemployed, which might explain things. So. <laughs> I have a lot more free time. <laughs> what is your current status? Um, I work on contracts at the moment, and then I'll be starting my PhD here at the University of Guelph in the fall. So, like I said, I have some free time at the moment. So, who are you so, going to be working with? Uh, I'm going to be working with Steve Marshall here at the University of Guelph. I did my master's and my undergrad thesis with him, so there's a bit of the whole, ooh, maybe don't do that thing that's going on, but um, the way I see it in our field, there's very few people, and most of them have all done their work with Steve to begin with, so... Hmm. Uh, I don't have an issue with that because now I'm outreaching and networking with all of you cool peeps. So, so what would you call your field? Uh, insect systematics is generally what I call it. So it's encompassing natural history, taxonomy, phylogenetics, evolution. Mm -hmm. um, so we kind of touch bases on all sorts of different things, um, looking at functional behaviors, uh, functional morphologies, speciation. Um, all the, the species level aspects of evolution essentially um, above population level. So not much population biology, but more metapopulation, if you want to call that uh, kind of the species concept idea. You know, I keep hearing, you know, again and again in the literature and, you know, when people are talking over beer and they're saying, you know, taxonomy is dying, you know, there's no practitioners, there's no money, there's no no spirit left in it. I don't know. What, uh, obviously, that's not my area. What do you think? Is yeah. it a dying breed? Uh, it's not so much, well, it's not so much dying as being left out in the cold to die like Star Wars. Um, <laughs> so we're having a lot of trouble, A, getting, getting money. Um, there's some money coming in, like there are some grants in the U.S. that have been quite, been quite successful. Um, there's a whole stream of NSF grants called the PEAK grants uh, that are geared for taxonomy. Um, but a lot of independent researchers are having a lot of try try trouble getting money just to do taxonomy. They usually have to get money to use applied questions or, or answer other questions, and then they do taxonomy sort of on the side. Um, there's very few labs that do taxonomy, insect taxonomy at least, uh, purely as their, their research focus. Um, so I'm lucky in that regard, that's where I'm at, uh, where we can concentrate on it full time, mm. uh, most of the time. Um, so yeah, so with very little money coming in, it's hard to attract students. And so that's the other issue is that uh, there's not a lot of grad students coming in wanting to do taxonomy um, yeah. for various reasons. Um, it, I mean, it's not the sexy science that you see, some molecular biology and, and stuff like that. Um, and then as well, it's 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 hard to say, come do be taxonomist and you'll have an awesome career because there's <laughs> there's very few of them and so they're coming up very slowly. But um, I think it's going to turn around in the next couple of years as everybody starts to to realize the, the lack of biodiversity knowledge that we've got and how we're starting to run ourselves into a bit of a hole without having the, the right names and the right concepts and the right people to understand them so or to help with them in some regards. So. Do you, like I know, especially in Canada right now, there's a serious issue with, you know, lack of um, science funding and 
a general political backlash, you might call it, against science and the government. Is that affecting taxonomy in Canada? Is it? Well, for most of taxonomy's uh, funding, it comes because we're, I wouldn't say on the theoretical side of things, but we're certainly not on the applied uh, pay grades um, or uh, funding lines. Um, and so we have pretty much only the only source of funding we can get generally is through NSERC, which is Canada's uh, National Science Research Engineering, Science and Engineering Research Council, um, which is kind of like the NSF for Canada. Um, and so what we can, it's pretty much the only place we can get funding unless we do these side projects where we can work on uh, groups that perhaps are of agricultural importance or um, sometimes you can get money if you're working on mosquitoes, black flies and the like that are of medical importance so you can get some funding there. Mm -hmm. But for the majority of species on earth that have very little impact on human life in a day-to-day -day capacity, there's not much funding. So we have to go through NSERC. Um, and the problem with NSERC is that they just announced this last year that they're going to try and refocus and go more towards um, sponsoring more projects uh, and programs that are going to have pretty much a deliverable at the end of it. So they're turning it more into an applied um, research granting system. So they're mm -hmm. going to try and favor projects where they can actually you know, get a patent out of it at the end or some sort of technology at the end, uh, which again isn't really going to be very conducive for us taxonomists that are studying tiny flies that are putting names on it. It's an important, it's important work and important science, obviously, but it's hard to explain it and to get other people who are trying to get a dollar out of it to actually appreciate it at times. Uh, I feel your pain. I mean, yeah. PhDs in theoretical behavioral ecology. It's <laughs> hard to get people to subscribe to the joy and wonder of that. So mm -hmm. I know what you mean, but it's sad. I mean, there's so many so many species out there that we don't know anything about. There's, you know, there's implications for that in our understanding of biology. And, you know, I don't know much about the actual practice of taxonomy, but I do weep for the fact that it's being so under. Yeah, so it kind of sucks in that regard. <laughs> it's a little bit stressful on a day-to-day -day basis, knowing that it's going to be a bit of an uphill battle. But like I said, I think that things are changing fairly rapidly and I think that um, in the near future we're going to be, we should see a turnaround and I'm hoping to see a turnaround in public attitudes and, and funding attitudes towards our work soon. So, Well, you know, we, we who hope to use your research salute you. <laughs> well, we'll do our best. We'll keep chugging. All right. Well, from that exciting and um, somewhat depressing note. <laughs> We should move on to mention briefly what had to be the world's biggest news story today. Yeah. That nobody understood. Yeah. <laughs> the, this is, it's sadly like Lonesome George from last week. You know, everybody getting on board and trumpeting the brilliant step forward and, you know, getting all excited and having no clue what they're talking about or... Yeah, you know. the significance or what it even is that it is. I mean, at least with Lonesome yeah. George, you, you can see it, and you can see it's a tortoise, and then you realize that that tortoise is no longer here. You yeah. get to the Higgs boson, you can't see it. Nobody can actually see it. They don't actually see the evidence of it. It's all crazy math and chemistry building back to, to try and trace it back, but, but nobody really can understand what it does. There's a yeah. really good video actually online um, that um, I think it's one of the science correspondents for The Guardian in the UK did. Um, it's a really nice article explaining what this Higgs boson is and how it actually imparts mass onto onto other articles or sorry onto other um, particles. Um, and it was really good. He had a nice video including ping pong balls and brown sugar and it made well, it really, really one. easy. Even I could understand sort of what was going on uh, and why it was so difficult to find this, this thing and why it was so important. So um, certainly I'm sure that uh, we can put up the link afterwards and, and I think everybody should go watch it because it actually was one of the better pieces of science communication I've seen 
for a very, very complicated topic like this. Lawrence Krauss had a nice piece on it, actually. Uh, it was very, very well done and mm -hmm. a very, a very sober look at it. You know, this is this is a good advancement. You know, it's great for physics. You know, now we get to go do the fun stuff. Yeah, ten billion dollars mm -hmm. to find this. <laughs> Carving up half the countryside in the middle of Europe. Yeah, there was actually, I mean, there was actually a, a note of reproach in his piece because, of course, the U.S. had been building the super colliding, uh, what's the actual name of it? The um, uh, Large Hadron Super Collider. Well, yeah, the the LHC is in Europe, but the U.S. had been building the LHC mm. in the U.S until the mid 90s when they uh, when they canceled the project halfway through yeah 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 there's yeah. a there's a giant hole somewhere still in the southern US i think it's in texas isn't it yeah i think so too and uh, he was he was mentioning this that there was this note of well you know we could have done this and mm -hmm. we just didn't have the will mm -hmm. and now it's in europe yeah which you it's know it's pretty much the moon race all over again they just didn't get behind it this time <laughs> Well, you know, I mean, they had to lose the space race the first time to go to go to the moon, didn't they? Yeah, pretty much, I guess. But so next time they're going to be all of America would turn into a super collider and they'll throw everything at it, perhaps. Literally you know, throwing all the particles. Dark matter farm right there. <laughs> and then soon we'll be warp driving. Now you're just making stuff up. <laughs> totally not, man. It's from Star Trek. It's totally Dude, gonna be real. You're, no, that's that's real. Somebody tells me that's real. <laughs> you're one mention away from being Deepak Chopra here. Oh no, no, no. <laughs> I actually, Ron I keep, Barry wouldn't lie to me. I keep waiting for Deepak Chopra to show up and you know <laughs> spout some ridiculous nonsense about quantum mechanics in the LHC now. Yeah. You know, how he's gonna curious. use the Higgs boson to, you know, cure your arthritis or. <laughs> I mean, that has to be next, right? Oh, I, I assume so. I assume so that uh, these nanoparticles will be injected right through well, you on a more daily you know, basis than they already are. If you think about it, there's actually a really natural link. I mean, you know, you've got homeopaths who take things and, you know, dilute them, you know, one to 30 million. All <laughs> they have to do is merge that with the Higgs, and, you know, now they've got super mass... <laughs> natural medicine something or other. I think we should just patent this idea right now and just make the million dollars off of it. I mean... <laughs> yeah, you know... Who cares about reputation side, in the scientific community? I, I think it's The dark side is appealing, you know? It is, they, it is. They have so cooking, much power. They have money, you know? <laughs> <laughs> the one aspect of the Higgs story that I did see that really... really kind of got my blood going, was this uh, this note that the CERN scientists who were presenting the data used Comic Sans in their slides. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. Oh. Yeah. And, dude, so they could solve the world's greatest mystery at our time, but they can't figure out how to use PowerPoint correctly. <laughs> <laughs> There's more than a little irony in that. Ten billion dollars on this project, and they couldn't afford a better font. That's you know. That's really sad. Helvetica is like a twenty-five dollar download. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm man. pretty sure that CERN scientists they were directly responsible for the deaths of at least five designers. <laughs> on the plus side, there's now a job opening for at least five designers. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose that's true. I like how you look on the bright side. That's about all we have to say for the Higgs, I think. Since yeah, this without, a without talking podcast. about it at all. <laughs> <laughs> Talked about everything around the Higgs. It's like we're one of those little particles circulating around it without actually talking about any of the science. <laughs> we hey, we, we briefly talked about our vague understanding of the science. Hmm. Yep, I'm good with that. I'm good with that, too. So uh, let's move on to... This story that you put into the lineup today, this uh, the world's smallest fly discovered. So why don't you uh, why don't you tell us about that one? All right, so we're we're back on air here. Uh, had a bit of a technical glitch while 
Chrome decided to go on vacation. And why don't you uh, why don't you just kind of recap some of the amazing biology that was going on there? All right. So I'm not sure where uh, where these edits came in and out. Um, so we've got a fly, tiny, tiny little fly, size of a, a house fly's eye, um, smaller than the fruit flies that you see flying around your house. Uh, so we've got a tiny fly from Thailand, found by a researcher who lives and works in Los Angeles, um, California, named Brian Brown. Uh, this Thailand fly is an antitapidating fly, so it, it goes about its life as a parasite. Uh, lays its eggs inside of an ant. The larvae, the maggot of the fly, develops inside the ant, eating the inside of the ant from the inside out. Eventually, it makes its way into the head, eats the jaw muscles of the ant, then moves on to the brain of the ant, turns it into a, a literally a, a mindless slave, a uh, mindless zombie. And then when it's ready to develop as a hu uh, as an adult, as a human, there we go, we're on the zombie land here. Uh, when it's ready to change into an adult, metamorphosize into an adult, it uh, it severs the connection, the membrane between the ant's head and its and the rest of its body. So the head falls off. The larvae of the fly will stay inside the head, and it will use the ant's head, hard head, as a protective case for it to undergo the last stage of its development. Um, so it'll pupate within the head of the fly or in the, the head of the ant, and then later it'll chew its way out of the head as an adult and emerge and start the cycle all over again. And so the fly can only be as big as the head of the ant for which it parasitizes. So you're restrained there. So this is where Brian took this next leap and he hypothesized which species of ant this fly is probably a parasite in. Um, so he's gone back, he's been working on, on uh, these flies, these um, these anticapitating flies uh, for a long time. And so he's gone through and he's actually tracked which species of fly parasitize which species of ants. And he's actually lined up the size of the fly versus the size of the ant and the size of the ant's head. And he's found this awesome correlation where bigger flies are parasites and bigger ants, because there's more room in the head, essentially. And smaller flies are paras parasitoids of smaller ants, because there's less room in the head, so they have to be smaller to fit into the head. It's like trying to get like a, an NBA player into your college dorm. It's, it's not so, it's not going to happen so well. There's a little bit of cramping going on. And so what he's actually been able to do then is he's actually gone through, he's followed this correlation, this graph, and he's hypothesized the size of the ant that this fly is going to be parasitizing. And it's going to be slightly bigger than the fly. So its head capsule is going to have to be slightly bigger than four millimeters. And so what he actually found is there is an ant that, uh, that lives in Thailand in the same sort of area. I don't think they're recorded from the exact same national park, um, but they will likely be found together in the same area. So he's found an ant that actually is the same size and should be the right size for this fly to actually um, develop in. And so what he's done is he's taken the functional morphology of this fly. He's n figured out through his other work with other species of flies, he's figured out exactly which ant we should be looking at, which species of ant we should be looking at in Thailand to try and find the host for this fly. So there's only a couple, couple of specimens known. It might only be a single specimen known actually of this fly, a single female. And yeah, it's only a single female known of this fly. But now he's figured out which, which kind of ant we should be looking for to find more of these flies. And so he's kind of figured out the biology of this fly from a single specimen based on all of his accumulated knowledge of other flies that are related to it. And so this whole idea of discerning a species complete biology from a single specimen that he didn't see alive, nobody's seen this thing alive, it was captured in a trap, um, so it was captured in, uh, they put out a trap in the woods, this fly happened to stumble into it, it ended up in the in the alcohol solution that we use to catch and kill the insects and preserve them, got sent across the ocean to, to Brian in in Los Angeles, and he went through and found it there. So nobody's seen this thing alive. We If any other case, we wouldn't have any idea about its biology other than, holy crap, look at this tiny little fly. What's going on here? But because of his, his extensive taxonomic knowledge, 
and because he can trace back through the taxonomy, he knows that it's related to, it's most closely related to another species of ant capitating fly, another species in Africa that goes to the same behavior of developing within the head of another ant species. So by combining all this different information, he's able to predict exactly which species, or at least which genus of ant, to look for to find this fly in the wild. And I think that's absolutely fantastic and an amazing story for for the value of taxonomy and how it it's not just counting and listing species like some people think, but it's actually uh, one of the core evolutionary biology disciplines and can give you a, a perfect roadmap for how uh, science and, and how the natural world is unfolding right below our eyes. Or even not in front of our eyes, we can't even see this thing. There's an awesome uh, picture on Brian's blog at flyobsession.net of the actual slide the slide, like your microscope slide, with yeah. the, the the actual fly on it, and it's a speck. Like it's smaller than the type on the the typing on the slide. Um, so these ant these flies are super small, gone unnoticed, and and he's traced back its entire biology and natural history, uh, and the entire food web essentially for this fly from this single specimen and his accumulated knowledge. So that is probably one of the coolest things I've seen in a paper in quite some time. Huh. It's pretty exciting. So that is pretty awesome. Yeah. So um, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I I'm just kind of you know bursting with questions. I, <laughs> this is a really cool <laughs> system. Do the ants need to decapitate? Do they have any sort of defenses? Yeah. So I we're gonna get into super ant time story here. So these these ant decapitating flies are really popular. Uh, there's a lot of species of them, and they're all over the world. So some of them uh, are actually um, parasitic on leafcutter ants. So those are, these are the ants that are in um, South and Central America. They're the ones that you see on nature documentaries where they're carrying the leaf over their head in the line. So you see all these lines of ants marching. They take the leaves back to their to their nest, and they feed them to fungus. So they're not actually eating the leaves. They're, they're cultivating a fungus in their nest, and they eat the fungus. Right. So what these ants have got is because they're out in the open for long stretches of time while they're walking back and forth from the plants to their nests, they're very, very susceptible to these flies, which will come in, they'll buzz above these lines, they'll find the lines, they'll buzz above the lines, and they'll zoom down and insert an egg inside of the ant's head, and that one's toes. So these ants, now I don't know whether this is going to be true, I doubt this is true for the other species um, of this actual tiny ant, but for these atta ants, these leafcutter ants, They've actually evolved um, an entire class of, of sisters, so an entire body form that is specifically meant to protect against these flies. So they're called minims, and they're like really tiny miniature ants that ride on top of the leaves, and they act as little protectors. So they sit on top of the leaves as these ants are carrying them back through the forest. They'll sit on top of the, uh, the, the leaf in the that the ant is carrying back to its nest. So these tiny little ants hitching a ride, and their entire job is to sit on top of that leaf and protect the, the bigger ant that's carrying it from these flies. So it's like a tiny little pit bull that they're using to, to protect against these parasitic flies. So you can see this fly parasitism has completely driven an entire new uh, social order in, in these ants as a method to get away from getting their colonies completely destroyed by these parasitic, ant, uh, parasitic flies. So like I said, I don't know whether there's anything like that going on in this other group. It's a different genus of ants, um, and not all ant uh, groups have these sort of these structures. As far as I know, it's just the atta um, or the leaf cutting groups that have these extra minims, the, the tiny little ants that ride. Um, but I assume that there are other ant other protections against these things, whether it's grooming or keeping um, heads down or not being as exposed outside as often. Which is where this tiny little ant, we can take another look at it, and we can see that it's all small and short, and it doesn't have many protuberances, and it's kind of all compact like the, a little jelly bean. And so I think Brian actually postulates that it lives within the ant colony itself, so it doesn't have to go out and fly through the forest necessarily to find it. it they live within the ant colony and that way they can actually attack the ants in their home rather than having to wait for them, like the, the Atta ants parasite has to wait to find them in the forest 
can attack them outside the colony. They're inside the colony, um, and they're attacking them from within. Um, and so that's why they have all these these minute uh, differences. So they look like jelly beans, so it's harder for the ants to pick them up and cause damage to them and you know, pick them apart because the ants are pretty aggressive that way. So do these flies, do they show like uh, specialization for this particular species of ant that they're parasitizing, or are they generalists? Um, I would suspect that they're probably specific. Um, I think most of, I think a lot of the Fords are very host specific, and I would assume that this fly being so damn small is probably quite suspe specific on on this ant. Maybe on uh, two, one, two, three species in that area, mm. if there are multiple super small ants like that. But I would suspect that, especially in this case where it's it's literally the head size has been so correlated, I would suspect that this is a long-established specialization that um, they're probably dependent on on this tiny little ant at this point. That makes so. sense. It's like that real estate saying, location, 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 right? Yeah, it's kind of important, especially if you need that, that species of ant or, or whatnot to get through. So anyway... Fascinating paper, short paper, free paper. It's open access as well, um, and so anybody can go read it and take a look at it. Uh, and it's it was just brilliant in my mind. The uh, not only the the cool looking fly that it exposed, but also this intricate and amazing biology that was explained through a single specimen, and uh, and our acknowledge our knowledge that we that Brian has accumulated. It's just cool. <laughs> so you mentioned that this was almost a, almost an accident that it it was in this trap and mm -hmm. they came across it. Is it a common occurrence in insect taxonomy, just stumbling across a new species? Yeah. Um, so most of our work is is done off of these traps, and so what these traps are, they kind of look like um, a tent. So if you think of like a pup tent. Uh, your standard triangular tent with uh, the sides and and um, and then they peek up to the top. So what this malaise trap is, it's called a malaise trap, it's essentially that, except instead of having outside edges, it's got open edges and a single single netting in the middle of it, and then the same tenting roof on top. So as things are flying through the forest, they hit this netting, and generally with flies at least, they, when they hit something, they'll fly up. And so when they hit this wall, They'll fly up, they'll fly up, they get funneled up into the top of this net. That net will go into a bottle of alcohol, they'll fly into the alcohol, and then we can pick them up a couple days later, a couple weeks later. So we use these traps all over the place. We also use other types of traps, like uh, pitfall traps, hand traps, and stuff like that. Again, so that we can collect insects, um, get more insects on our trips than we're putting in time. So instead of hand collecting them all and seeing them all, we're using these traps to try and increase our productivity. And so a lot of these times, uh, especially with these weird things, you only get a single specimen, maybe two, maybe three specimens at a time. And so a lot of insect species are described off of what we call singletons or very small series of insects. Mm -hmm. um, so if you find something interesting like that, we can go back and more intensively sample an area. So now, say, Brian, can go back to this area where he found this uh, fly to the specific spot that we found it, and you can take a closer look now um, and look for this unusual fly and try and find it in its location. But for the most part, all of our traps are, are literally drawing random, trying to get as many random specimens as we can, so we put them and increase our odds of picking up something interesting by going to new localities or using different trapping methods than we've used before. And then just sorting through all of the, the random things that, that happen to stumble into these traps. So it's like the giant, it's essentially a, a very, very, very random um, uh, what's it called? Uh, uh, transect is essentially what it is. So you're mm. transecting the wild with these traps and just hoping that something interesting goes into them. So. You know, I don't mean to turn this into the uh, interview Morgan hour, but I'm, <laughs> I'm actually really interested in this. I'm, you know, forgive my ignorance. Again, taxonomy mm -hmm. is not a strength of mine, but I'm curious. I mean, when you pull these specimens out, you know, I know that 
you were mentioning, you know, there's a lot of tax, you know, taxonomic knowledge and, you know, you, you acquire experience and such, but, you know, what happens when you come across a particular specimen? Do you tend to recognize them on site? Do you immediately notice, oh, hey, I've never seen that before? You know, what's the process of discovery? So it, uh, it depends. Like, uh, like I said, a lot of our time is spent going through these samples or going through museum collections. So that's where we get all of our data from, is from either stuff that we've sampled our stuff ourselves. So when we go out in the field, we'll have these traps, and we'll bring it back to the lab a couple of days later, a couple weeks later, and go through it. Um, we'll also go through as many museum specimens as we can. So we go through like specimens from the uh, Smithsonian Museum in Washington, the National History Museum in London, all the different natural history museums with full specimens, because they've got accumulated material. Um, so we'll generally be looking for things that we're, that we're uh, specialists on. So in my case, I'd be looking at stilt-legged flies. Brian would be looking for forids, these anti-capping flies. Um, if I had seen this thing, I probably wouldn't have had any idea what it is. I'd say, that's fantastic and cool, and I'm going to pick that aside. I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to send it off to somebody else to work on, but that's pretty cool. When Brian sees it, because of his accumulated knowledge working with these forids, he's able to put it probably onto the tree of life fairly quickly. And as we become specialists at these projects, this is where taxonomy, again, takes a significant amount of time. It's not something that is as easily picked up as, as other things, because you need to become intimately familiar with, with um, what all these different species look like, so you can start placing them. But as you develop that knowledge, and as you come up with this uh, background of knowledge, this roadmap of the tree of life for your group in your head, you can start fitting in things places where they fit. And so Brian likely came through, was sorting through this this um, this residue, this trap uh, stuff that was brought over from Thailand, and he probably came across it and found it, um, and then just worked his way through it. When he saw it, he probably pulled it aside saying, that's pretty unique, that's unusual, I've only ever seen something that looks like this from Africa, which suggests that this is probably something new. So then he'll pull it aside, he'll mount it up on the slide like he showed in his blog, and then he'll go through the, the process of describing it and putting up the paper. Mm. So it, it really, really backs on a lot on prior experience um, sorting residues and, and, like I said, understanding what other species have been found before um, for the group. So. so is this something that, you know, amateur scientists or you know, interested uh, civilians, as it were, maybe mm -hmm. getting involved in or things they can contribute to? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, taxonomy is uh, is a ma massive amateur, I say amateur, by amateur I mean not paid to do taxonomy. Mm. Um, so taxonomists, there are a lot of amateur taxonomists um, out working and publishing on a regular basis. Uh, there was just a paper a couple weeks ago, a couple months ago in PLOS, talking about how many amateur entomologists there were, amateur taxonomists working in Europe, and the, the progress that the amateur community has been making there. Um, but there's lots and lots of people, again, because there's aren't, there aren't that many jobs to become a pure taxonomist getting paid to do it, so many people use it as a hobby. It's, it's an old hobby. Darwin was uh, a taxonomist back in the day before he became an evolutionary. Uh, biologist. Well, we're all evolutionary biologists, but before he became known for his work on taxonomy, he established, a, sorry, before he came trying to postulate and share his ideas on evolution by natural selection, he established his, his academic street cred by becoming a taxonomist for barnacles. And so taxonomy has gone a long, has gone a long ways back um, as being an amateur or an unpaid hobbyist kind of uh, discipline for a long time, and it's, it's what's kept taxonomy going for a long time is, is amateur taxonomists. Um, and so there's there's a bunch of resources, especially for entomology um, in North America in particular, where hobbyists can help contribute to our understanding of taxonomy, um, either by collecting and sending specimens. There's a bunch of different groups that are out there working with uh, these um, citizen science groups where they ask people to collect ants in New York City, for example. There's the, the School of Ants project, and they're asking people in big cities to collect just the ants in their backyard. 
because we don't really understand it. And they found new things in Manhattan. They found a new species of ant in Manhattan a couple of years ago, um, hmm. just because nobody bothered to look. And so these citizen science groups are great. They also help to to add specimens and, and photos to our records. So they can help us expand where we know these species are from. So if you visit bugguide.net, you can actually see all this user community where people are taking photos of insects, uploading them to this, this community, and then tax professional taxonomists, amateur taxonomists, and enthusiasts are all going through and identifying them. And now people are going, researchers are using these photos and these records to make new uh, understandings of where these species occur in North America. So we've got amateurs that are contributing data. We've got amateurs that are contributing actual science, the, the taxonomy. They're undergoing revisions and describing species themselves. Um, and then we've got amateurs that are, are just keen and want to know more about it. So taxonomy is, is like I said, is very heavily driven by unemployed taxonomists um, in many of the areas, which huh. is it's, it's fantastic in one regard, but it's also, it'd be nice for people to be getting paid and the academic acknowledgement for, for this work that they're doing. But That's true. But uh, mm -hmm. lots of people love it, and lots of people do it in their, in, as a hobby. So. How has uh, how's the revolution in molecular biology affected taxonomy, you know, and the kind of work that you might be doing? So, yeah, it's changed the game a little bit. Um, whereas the amateurs are great, they can do all the morphological taxonomy they want. Molecular taxonomy is pretty much out of the hands of anybody that isn't funded by a major grant. Um, it's expensive work. Um, and so we've got uh, molecular taxonomists are now starting to use more characters. So um, it's essentially all it is is using DNA data as new characters to try and differentiate species and to recreate um, how they may be related to one another. Uh, and so this is something, like I said, that's not really in the reach of uh, amateurs, and so this is work is being done mostly by um, professionally employed taxonomists in research institutions like universities or government agencies uh, to do the work. Um, again, it's mostly at this point just for figuring out relationships between species. Um, there's been a little bit of work done on trying to, people trying to say we should be using molecular characters as the sole representation for species identification or um, differentiation, so describing the species based on genes alone. Um, but so far, the rules, I think, are pretty, the rules for naming new species are still pretty strict on saying it's got to have at least some morphology in there as well. So mm -hmm. while, while the, the genes and stuff are certainly contributing to a new avenue for taxonomists to explore, um, the citizen side of it is still very much a big portion of it. It's just two different tracks going on now, trying to look at high relationships and those that are still working and and spending time on describing the new species rather than how they're all related to one another. One of the areas I've been keeping an eye on is the advent of DIY bio and mm -hmm. the the lower costs of doing molecular biology these days, you know, where we're getting down to you know five hundred dollars you know, where you can kit out a home lab and, you know, be doing, you know, PCR and and such like this. Do you see any potential future where the citizen science of taxonomy and the molecular biology, you know, perhaps in the DIY range come together? Um, I suspect that we'll probably see some people try it, but I think that the most that most of the citizen science, the amateur taxonomists, are doing it because they like looking at bugs. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think they get most of their joy from going out in the field, collecting new insects, pinning new insects, keeping their own collections, um, having a physical representation of, of the phenotype, um, the actual, what, not just what the DNA, the string of DNA, but actually what the DNA creates. So, bits and pieces of those DNA pieces come together. So I think at heart, most uh, amateur taxonomists, and, and especially in, in my line of work, where I find the most joy is in the morphology, 
what the actual insect looks like and how it works. Um, as an example, if we had just bet, went off of DNA for this tiny fly, you wouldn't know anything about it other than it was a new species. By looking at how, what it looks like and, and comparing that to other things, we can figure out a little bit more about its biology. So that's why molecular taxonomy is probably never going to completely erase uh, traditional morphological but I would say that probably most amateurs will continue to do what they do, being expert naturalists, professional naturalists in that regard, um, and getting out there, finding new species, and uh, not so much going towards the molecular work unless they really need to in some regards. I could be completely well, wrong. Perhaps everyone's just itching to get their own do-it-yourself PCR and, and uh, genome sequencing kit in their backyard, but I suspect that most of them are doing it for their love of the bugs rather than um, than trying to get the DNA. But we'll see. It's going to be interesting. I can see that. In some ways, the way you're describing it makes you know the citizen science aspect of taxonomy sound a lot like amateur astronomy. You know, mm -hmm. people looking up at the stars just to go see them. You know, mm -hmm. maybe not sitting at a hundred million dollar observatory, but you know, they've got a telescope and they like looking at the sky. And they still make significant contributions to our to our uh, our knowledge of the stars, the same as amateur and unemployed uh, taxonomists and naturalists and entomologists make a huge, huge contribution to our, our knowledge in insect systematics. So, you know, I recall reading a story of a fellow, he was an amateur astronomer and he was he was amazing at uh, finding a particular class of celest celestial objects. I think it was supernovas. Mm -hmm. um, bagging them left and right and making all of the you know, multi-million dollar astronomy teams look really bad. Mm -hmm. But is there any, any uh, parallel in the taxonomy world? Are there you know, superstar citizen scientists out there who are just bagging huge numbers of unexplained or undiscovered bugs? Uh, I'm, I'm sure there are. Um, well, Ted McRae, he blogs at Beetles in the Bush. Um, he, uh, his day job is working for an agricultural company. Um, but in his spare time, he's a beetle taxonomist. And he's described several species. He's um, written keys. He's like I said, described many species. He's worked on the biology and the host biology of several groups of wood-boring beetles. Um, and that's all as a hobby, essentially. The, he does that in the evenings and after work. Um, he's done quite a few species. I don't know um, any numbers of like the most prolific amateur entomologists, um, but I know that there are lots, and I know that there are some very, some very prolific people out there who have devoted a lot of time to to studying the species around them in many regards. So, uh, I can't give you a hard number on that, unfortunately, but there are a lot of people, and there are some very, very dedicated people that spend a lot of time um, building up their own personal collections and, and studying these things. You know, you mentioned Darwin and barnacles, and I know that Darwin was also a huge collector of insects, especially beetles. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, one of the things I noted when I was reading about this was that he was engaged in what we would consider these days to be a social network. You know, he had a, a whole group of people who he was, you know, corresponding with and trading specimens with and competing with, you know, and, you know, it was this proto uh, taxonomic social network. But it makes me wonder these days, you know, what your feelings are on how the internet has changed the game and you know what kind of effects it's had from your end and from the citizen end and you know where that's where that's headed in the future uh, I think it's I think the internet is probably one of the single greatest um, tool of use for the taxonomic community um, like I said it's connecting the scientists whether they're employed or unemployed uh, as taxonomists with a huge user base of people interested in insects and taking photos. So um, there's been multiple cases that I know of where people have photographed insects for the first time in a new locality, so they've expanded range, they've shared their photos, sometimes new species, first time the specimen's been photographed, um, or collected online, and they share it on these, on these 
forum saying, what's this? And everybody's like, I don't know. I have no idea what that is, but that's amazing. Can you get more? Um, there's the increase in our knowledge of behavior and biology because of this. Is, it's been astounding. And so what it does is, is it more readily um, connects the amateurs in places where there aren't natural history museums to those people that are at these natural history museums, essentially. So most of the time, you'll see taxonomists, especially insect taxonomists, centered around these big museums in Ottawa, in Washington, in New York, London, England, Paris, these sorts of places, because this is where we've got our giant data banks um, of hard specimens. So this is where we've been doing most of our work for the last 200 years. Um, and so if you're in the middle of Alberta or Saskatchewan, you might not have access, ready access to these scientists. You might not even know that they would have existed back in the day. You would have seen a grasshopper, and you may have taken it to your, your agricultural wrap, your local um, farm wrap or whatever. We may have been able to help you. But if you had something that wasn't agriculturally related, it was pretty much out for lunch. So by the internet connecting and making available all of these professional taxonomists or uh, expert amateurs to uh, the greater community of people just walking through their backyard and finding a bug that they don't know what it is, it allows them to connect on a way that they ne have never been able to do before. And I'm, so far I've been talking about having the, the citizens, the general public, sending things to the, um, the researchers. But the internet's also helping us the other way around by allowing the researchers to contribute back and provide tools to the, the general public by the way of um, publications like uh, identification keys. Um, and so these tools, these identification keys, uh, if they're done properly and if they're made open access and freely available, they allow anybody to go through and identify their bugs for themselves. So instead of taking that strange that bug they found in their backyard, now they can maybe take it online and get an identification themselves and then go to their, their respective um, professional and say, hey, look, I found this species. It's not known from this location or I found it doing this. Is that known? How is that helpful? Is that cool? Um, and so these keys are, are becoming really popular. And, and I, again, I'm, I'm, I'm the technical editor for the Canadian Journal of Arthropod Identification. And the entire journal's purpose is publishing these keys open access. Um, so people can, so the researchers are getting academic credit for, for this, not quite outreach because it's useful, but for publishing these keys and for disseminating their, apply, their knowledge that they've acquired over the last, their careers. And now uh, interested naturalists and citizens and general populace can go out, use these keys, generally because they're well illustrated and, and trying to make by the magic of the web with as many photos and illustrations as you can cram into it for free, um, hopefully they can identify and, and start contributing even more to our, our knowledge of these insects. So it's a two-way street for sure with um, the general populace helping with biology and specimens and then the, the group experts providing the tools for the general populace to understand and identify their what hmm. One more question on the, uh, the technology front. I'm curious if the advent of mobile computing and, you know, like smartphones and mapping mm -hmm. technology and GPS, mm -hmm. uh, what kind of effect has this had and, you know, what do you expect in the future from that? Yeah. Um, so not only is it great because you can take these these tools. So you can take your journal articles, like I said, your keys into the field with you. If you wanted, you saw an inter interesting bug and you wanted to identify, and you can do it right in the field now with your iPhone. But you can also use different tools like um, iNaturalist, which is an app where you can start recording your sightings. You can start using, um, if you're on my phone, I can't remember what the other one is. Um, Project NOAA is another one where these things are starting to aggregate where you can start putting your inputting your spottings and then scientists can start using that data in their work. Um, but also the iPhone is the most popular camera. Uh, it's contributed the most photos to Flickr. 
So mm. if you've got a camera with you at all times, it means that you can take a photo and increasingly better quality, um, even for macro work, with your phone and upload it to places like Bug Guide or Flickr. So if you go to Flickr and you just search insect, you come up with, I can't remember where it was. I had the number last fall and I can't remember where it is now. It was a huge number. I want to say uh, it was 150,000 or 1.5 million images of insects uploaded by users. I think it was 1.5 million and about 150 of them actually. 150,000 of them or more had GPS data, so they actually were geo-referenced as well. Hmm. And so this mobile technology of having the ability to take a picture and upload it to these uh, various web databases while still standing in front of the insect um, is, is fantastic. And I think it's going to rapidly change the way that people are connecting with nature. Because now they're no longer just saying, oh, there's an interesting bug. They can actually take a picture of it, potentially find out what the ID is, and then read about its biology on the Encyclopedia of Life all within five minutes and still looking at the bug. So we come back to Star Trek a little bit here, and you get the little tricorder, and it comes up with beep, boop, beep, boop, beep, and it comes back with all the information in Encyclopedia of Life. That's where we're moving to with the, the ability of the, the interconnected webs of information between taxonomy naturalists and, and internet resources. So Funny you should say tricorder since you could build your own now. The, um, <laughs> have you seen the plans for that? No, I have not. No, the, there's a fantastic guy out there. I'll, I'll put it in afterwards, but it's he's created what amounts to a, a tricorder and it's got sensors. Oh, sweet. And it's based, I think it's based on an Arduino design and you know it looks like one and you can, you can build it and it's got touch screens and it's Sweet. it's awesome. But, uh, <laughs> you know, it's funny because one of the big themes in molecular biology the last 20 years has been data and too much of it, right? Mm -hmm. You know, bioinformatics sprung up as a field largely because people needed to learn how to handle these huge amounts of data coming in. Mm -hmm. The way you're describing it sounds like, you know, taxonomy is on the verge of having a similar you know, crush in terms of data coming down the pipe and mm -hmm. needing new tools to deal with it. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I was just going to say, where are you dealing with that as we get into this whole genome as applied to relationships business? Um, mm. That's a big stop, stop right now for a lot of the molecular biologists is dealing with these massive amounts of data and, and analyzing it and getting a, a tree of life out of it. <laughs> it's just a massive amount of human power. But Fair enough. dealing with the images and stuff like that, I don't know whether we'll have quite that overboard yet, but it's getting there. Well, I have some ideas on that, actually. We should talk about that later. But, Sounds good. Um, the, uh, one, one final question on this. Uh, what's the most interesting specimen you've ever come across? The most interesting specimen I've ever come across? That's a good, that's a good question. Let's see. Well, I mean, I've, I've found a couple of specimens. Um, new species that are currently awaiting description. Uh, I'll be describing them later in the summer, so through the course of my master's work, I found some several new species in that regard. Um, just this couple of weeks ago, I was up in Ottawa, and I found uh, a species that I thought was for sure in my group, but it's it's not. It's a new species probably from a completely unrelated group of flies, and it just looks almost exactly, except odd, like my group of flies. So, Totally unrelated, um, but the shape and the size of it and the color pattern and stuff like that completely mimic the earth, my group. So uh, that was pretty sad as well. Hmm. But I don't have any weird, tiny, super tiny flies in mine. Mine are all in the color and big. Well, it's been, uh, wow, it's been well over an hour at this point. <laughs> I didn't <laughs> intend, I didn't really didn't intend to turn it into interview you uh, episode, but that's kind well, of the next way time I'll, I'll take a back seat and I'll interview everybody else. <laughs> well, actually, no, I I really actually want to thank you for that because you know it was an interesting insight into taxonomy which I've never had before and mm -hmm. I feel like I learned a lot about it just from listening to you talk about it. You talk about it very well. Thanks. So, but I think at this point we can pretty much wrap it up and call that the third episode since. It's now 1.30 in the morning, and I would like to get something resembling sleep today. 
<laughs> that sounds like a good plan to me. So that's episode three of the podcast. Uh, for anybody who happens to be listening to this, if you'd like to comment or ask questions or otherwise be involved in the conversation, you can drop us a line at breakingbio at gmail.com or follow us on Twitter at breakingbio. And I'd like to thank Morgan for joining today and for turning unwittingly into the subject of the podcast. And uh, we'll see you next time.